everyone, and welcome to Visual Radio. It is February 9th, 2012, and on the phone with me is Jerry Ross. Hello, Jerry. Hello there. The best songs, Joe, are the ones that take you where you want to go. So thank you for inviting me in. We've got a lot to talk about tonight, Jerry. We've got the Beatles to talk about. The, uh, yeah. I want to talk about Colossus Records. I want to talk about Bobby Hebb. Spanky and our gang. You just talked to Spanky a few weeks ago. Yes, I did. She's been a guest on this show many times. She, she's just doing great. She's just amazing. I enjoy talking to Spanky. We, we make sure that we touch base at least more than one time a year. And uh, she recently told me she was coming into Philadelphia. Uh, last time I saw her in person was here in Philadelphia when she was invited by John Phillips to come on stage and tour with Mamas and Papas uh, and to sing the parts of, for Mama Cass. And of course, Mama Cass could never be replaced, but when Spanky Elaine McFarland appeared on that stage, you knew that a star was still shining. Spanky... Uh Infusing her own hits really brought a nice perspective, another dimension to Mamas and the Papas. Absolutely. And that respect uh, went worldwide uh, when she was invited by, uh, by John to, uh, to tour with him. I saw them here in Philadelphia. I guess it was, uh, um, well, I'm not going to tell you the year, but with the last time that they toured, uh, it was standing room only, uh, and the fans were around the block more than once. She's going to be playing in California. Uh, Denny Diaz from Steely Dan is going to perform with them. And do you know Harriet Shock, the woman who wrote Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady for Helen Reddy? Yeah, so we, we have spoken many times over these many musical years, and uh, uh, glad to hear that she's... Uh, Alive and well, and... Harriet is a dear friend of mine, and I hooked her up with Dinky Dawson, the sound man for Spanky. So she might appear on stage and do some of the hits with her. They might do Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady together. Well, I'm sorry that they're not doing Sunday Will Never Be the Same, but Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady is a well, good follow-up. Well, Spanky will be doing all her hits, of course. Um... How did you find, did you work with the New Wine Singers or did you work with them when they were spanky? Well, interestingly enough, I was invited by uh, the president of then Mercury Records uh, back in the uh, mid-60s uh, to uh, take a look at one of the new acts that they were planning to sign. And uh, I was in the uh, New York offices on uh, 55th, and 8th, uh, 55th and 7th Avenue, I think it was at the time. They keep moving around so much, Joe, that I, it's hard to keep track of where they are. It's true. But anyhow, I was invited to uh, go out to Chicago, and I met with Spanky and our gang at a club called Mother Blues on the north side of Chicago. And, of course, in those days, I was dressed in my, uh, uh, my Brooks Brothers suit, my regimental tie, and I recall this like it was yesterday, because when I went in to greet the group, <laughs> Spanky came forward and greeted me, and she said, if you're, going, if you're going to work with us, take off that effing suit. That was my introduction to Spanky in our game. Interesting. Yes. The Music Licensing Company is up on your website. Yes. Now, these are songs that you license to other people. These Do are songs that are in my music catalog, most of which uh, I had the, uh, the pleasure and, and fun and enjoyment of working with a lot of different collaborators. And also, uh, my firm represents a lot of songwriters. So uh, we solicit, when we say we, I mean my company and myself, solicit those wonderful songs for film, motion pictures, television, advertising commercials. For instance, getting back to Spanky, uh, a big Tide commercial several years ago was Lazy Day. Ah. From the first album. Yes. And that's probably, uh, Lazy Day is probably their biggest hit record, recording. Um, second, of course, to Sunday Will Never Be the Same. And uh, then followed with uh, Making Every Minute Count. And 
and like to get to know you, and the beat goes on. Now, when she did those other records with the, uh, there was the arrangers on your record became her producers. Well, yes and no. Uh, I produced um, some of my favorite arrangers who I'm still in touch with today and love them dearly because they were so helpful and once again great collaborators with me, Joe Renzetti and Jimmy Wisner. Uh, by happenstance and by choice, um, some of the musicians that sat in on our sessions were uh, Stu Scharf and uh, his writing partner. And when I made a decision to, uh, to start my own companies and I was leaving uh, Mercury, uh, it was uh, Mercury's decision, not mine, uh, to go on with other uh, producers who they could more or less control. <laughs> they couldn't control Jerry Ross because I was producing hits. They were only looking for records. I was trying to develop artists, and that was one of the areas that, uh, that set us apart. Anyhow, um, Like to Get to Know You uh, was uh, arranged by, I think, Sue Sharp. But Spanky and our gang are, are best known for, and I'm very proud to say, is uh, Sunday Will Never Be the Same, and Lazy Day. Absolutely. I, I think that I'd like to get to know you is just so Jerry Ross. It's like they knew that you had the great formula and they basically copied it. Well, you know, imitation, as people say, is the sincerest form of flattery. And without the big hits that preceded, because when I first met up with Spanky and, and the group, they were flower power. Uh, they were doing songs uh, that were relating to... Uh, uh, the culture of the times, uh, wonderful performing type songs, interesting from an intellectual standpoint, but not very uh, marketable and commercial. Uh, so I brought to them what I was hearing, uh, what I heard and what I saw, eventually the world saw and heard, when I brought them the Powers and Fish Off songs uh, from Lazy Day, and, and the wonderful uh, the song from um, uh, Terry Cashman, the Sunday Will Never Be the Same. Yeah, T Terry Cashman uh, brought me a demo of a song that he, said that he had told me at the time he was showing around to, uh, uh, to various producers, and he came to me because he thought that I would be the one to take it to the top. And when I heard the song, it was the first place that I went to uh, was to play it for Spanky and the, and the group and uh, sat down with, uh, with my arranger, Joe Renzetti and Jimmy Wisner, and the rest was history. Now, Jimmy Wisner, of course, is famous for many Tommy James records. Yes, uh, Jimmy and I um, have collaborated with our music for many, many years. Uh, our first big hit together was a huge dance that broke here in Philadelphia and uh, was called The 81 by Candy and the Kisses. And Jimmy was the arranger on that. Jimmy arranged a lot of great songs with me, uh, with Keith and, and Spanky and Jay and the Techniques. Jimmy ra arranged uh, Keep the Ball Rolling Techniques and 98.6 uh, and Ain't Gonna Lie for Keith. Wonderful, wonderful music. Yeah, um, a great, just a great collaborator. And without the collaboration of, uh, of and I, I always repeat that particular phrase because you cannot do it alone. We had the greatest musicians, uh, the best arrangers, the best studios, and the timing was just right. Everything was on the page. <coughs> And uh, groups like, like Spanky and Keith and uh, my wonderful experiences with, uh, with Jerry Butler, uh, who was two takes and you had a record. That's pretty amazing. Talent will out. I didn't say it. I think his name was Shakespeare. La La La, I Love You, the Delphonics. What a tremendous record. I had nothing to do with that. I know, but it's on your catalog. I wanted to uh, bring it up and ask your... <laughs> Pardon me for interrupting you, but it's, it's one of my favorite songs with the Delphonics, and it's so 
it's so well related with the Philadelphia sound. Uh, but Tommy Bell, who arranged and produced it, uh, a dear friend of mine for these many years, and we worked together uh, back in the day. Tommy um, was uh, uh, a fantastic keyboard player, played on a lot of my sessions, and we soon discovered had a marvelous ability to arrange, and he did so much with uh, the stylistics and, uh, and the Delphonics, and then I found a group that had that kind of uh, sound out of Trenton, New Jersey, uh, called the Courtships, and their, uh, their recordings of uh, uh, some of the things that I did with them are in my uh, Yo! Philadelphia CD that I'm very proud of. So, um, Tom Bell, who of course uh, really did well with the Philly sound, you guys had created something that Gamble and Huff just really uh, exploded onto the scene with the great work that you had laid the foundation for. Well, you know, before there was a Rogers and Hammerstein, there was a Rogers and Hart. Yep. Before there was a Gamble and Huff, there was a Gamble and Ross. I discovered Kenny Gamble when he was 17 years old. He used to, rang, he used to hang around my office in Philadelphia at the Schubert Theater building. And he always used to say to me, uh, I can sing, I can sing. You got, you got to hear me sing. So one afternoon I said, okay, Ken, show me what you got. And he started to sing. And I said, wow. He was like a young Jerry Butler, like a young, um, who am I thinking of, uh, uh, with Mercury that had so many wonderful hits. Just a great baritone. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised. So we started to collaborate together. Um, I got a call from uh, Clive Davis's office in New York that they were looking to try to develop the new sounds that were coming out of Philadelphia. And I, at that, that, at that time, uh, was responsible for developing some new young street corner doo-woppers. Uh, I produced a, a record that is a classic called When We Get Married by the Dream Lovers. And then I signed a group that Kenny and I worked with very closely called the Sapphires, and our first hit with them was Who Do You Love? And then we did um, the 81 with the Candy and the Kisses. So Columbia and most of the majors then and now were never leaders. So they were always followers. And uh, Clive liked what I was doing, so he brought me up to New York, and he said, let's make a production deal where we can develop and distribute your music worldwide, where it's very difficult for you to do it independently. So the first artist that I brought him was Kenny Gamble. And uh, Kenny and I and Jimmy Wisner went into Columbia Studios. And Kenny and I sat down and wrote a, a song called You Don't Know What You Got Until You Lose It, who I later did with Jerry Butler, and it's on Bobby Hebb's album, one of my, one of my favorite uh, uh, compositions. And uh, we released it on Columbia, and it did rather well in Philadelphia and New York, uh, but it didn't do what we really anticipated it to do. Uh, Kenny and I wrote together and collaborated together for almost 10 years. And Huff was our keyboard player. Ah. Huff and Tommy Bell played keyboards on many of my sessions. And at that time, it was Gamble and Ross that was doing the writing. <coughs> Kenny didn't start producing with Leon until maybe three or four years into our relationship uh, when I moved to New York <laughs> and um, first met, uh, was brought into New York by my mentor, Shelby Singleton, who also, like Clive, wanted me to bring into the Mercury organization uh, the, uh, the street corner doo-wop and the new pop sound that was coming out of Philly, sound of Philadelphia, uh, is what they called it. And I was the other sound of Philadelphia before Gamble and Huff. But uh, uh, Kenny and Leon started uh, their label, Philly International, in 1972. Kenny and I met and worked together in 1963 when I brought them to Columbia. And then when I went to New York, um, one of the first artists that Shelby wanted me to uh, uh, 
uh, to work with was a was an artist that they were thinking about signing. His name was Bobby Bobby Hebb, and uh, Bobby and I uh, sat down together, and I said, uh, you know, show me what you got. And we went into a little demo studio in uh, in New York, and we laid down with just with Bobby and his guitar and me. Uh, about ten songs, one of which was Sonny. And there for was the magic. So we recorded Sonny in uh, early 66, and um, the musicians on the date are now part of a classic. Sonny went to number one all over the world, According to BMI, there are 565 recordings of Sonny. And Sonny is in the top 25 of all-time hit records in the last 100 years. It is an amazing story. Amazing. Uh, the, the other 10 songs, have you listened to them lately? Yeah, I listened to them not lately but from time to time and uh, wherefore comes the, the next Sonny and that brought me to uh, another behind the scenes story when we learned that Sonny was climbing the charts very quickly and Mercury requested an album from Bobby and myself and I sat down with Bobby and I said okay I said this record's going to go all the way maybe to number one I said we got to do a follow up so let me hear some other things that you've written. And Bobby played some songs for me, and I said, you know, Bobby, God willing, you'll write another Sonny, but so far I haven't heard anything that really uh, is going to establish you as a, as a recording artist. And, uh, and until you do that, let me show you and play for you uh, some songs that I've been holding that I think uh, me as a song man, so to speak, uh, would like to uh, to have you here, and I'd like to go in and record them with you. So I played him a song called Apples, Peaches, Pumpkin Pie, and Bobby immediately said, mm, I don't know, I'd really like to record songs that I wrote. And I said, well, until you do that, uh, we have to really go into your bag of tricks and come out with a second song. And of course, as you know, Joe, Bobby's Roots came out of Nashville, and uh, my country roots, and love the country music, as many do, uh, one of my favorites was Satisfied Mind. And I said to Bobby, why don't we redo this in today's uh, generation we'll be hearing it basically for the first time. And of course, it's in the Bobby Hebb Sonny album. Uh, and it did rather well. It got some nice exposure, but it wasn't the hit that we wanted it to be. Oh, it was top 40. Uh, Porter Wagner had number one hit with it in the 50s, right? I don't ever think that it was Porter Wagner. Satisfied Mind seems to be in my, in my head. Um, and I just can't come up with the name right now. But hopefully before our conversation passes us by, uh, I'll remember who did the original record. So, yeah, Satisfied Mind went to number uh, top, top 40, but I remember six years later, your song, Love, 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 launched off of the Sunny album in England and went top 35. Yeah, well, when I said to Bobby at the time, well, if you don't write it, I will, and one of the songs that I presented to Bobby was Love, Love, Love. It's in the album, the original Sunny album, and like I said, I dream of it, I see it, I hear it, and eventually the whole world heard it. And Love, Love, Love became a huge hit in what they called Northern Soul, and still is very popular in the United Kingdom. Now, it's such a perfect record for the time in America, uh, but it didn't come out as a single, did it? Or maybe it did um, on Mercury. Well, you're the maven. You're the trivia expert. I, I don't recall. I'm under the weather tonight. That's my uh, excuse. Usually... I'm under the weather tonight. It sounds like a song. <coughs> there you go. Write it down. It's but uh, Love, Love, Love should have been a hit. It's got that same flavor as Keith and uh, Spanky. A, a sunshine pop, they call it. It's very sunshine pop. It was in the pocket. But like many things, uh, 
timing was everything, and uh, the, the extraordinary thing that happened when I said to Bobby, well, if you can't do Apple's Peaches, I'm going to find Mickey Mouse in Back Porch, Idaho, and they're going to have the hit. And so, long and be, lo and behold, um, a DJ friend of mine in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, who from time to time would hit me to a, a new young act that was appearing in one of the clubs or venues, sent me Jay and the Techniques. And when I brought him into the studio, we taught him the song, and um, ready or not, here I come. Gee, it used to be such fun. <laughs> a lot of people said, I don't want to sing a song or, about a fruit. And I said, it's not about a fruit. It's about love. It's about finding that gal and chasing after her and catching up to her and say, ready or not, here I come. It became a worldwide hit. As a matter of fact, Jay and the Techniques have been working off of that song for the last 30 years or more. They just returned from a tour in Japan. Now, is my friend Rick still working with Jay, the guitar player from Florida? As a matter of fact, he's graduated to become their manager. Works with them very closely. They do a lot of tours. They do some cruises. Um, they play, um, as a lot of the 60s mem mem memorabilia acts are doing today, they play a lot of nursing homes, believe it or not, uh, for that generation, which was my generation, who loves the music, absolutely loves the music. Now, a lot of your records, uh, especially Bobby Hebb's, fit into subgenres, um, you know, pop, R&B, but then you got that Northern Soul we talked about, but also Sunshine Pop. Sunny and Love, Love, Love are both Northern Soul, but they're Sunshine Pop. So there are these pockets of people, and we're talking a lot of people, tens of thousands of people, that are rabid about certain sounds. I find it very interesting that your records fit into these other worlds very nicely. Well, you know, at that time, um, and it was truly by accident, I didn't do it intentionally, you had Beatlemania had hit this, uh, uh, hit the world of music, and um, I went in a totally other direction and just thinking and tr trying to uh, tell my stories, I used to call them three-minute soap operas, and tell my stories in the manner in which I would reach that generation. And when you listen to uh, recordings and songs like 98.6, it's like you really have to pay attention once the sound of the record captures you to listen to the lyric. And uh, it, it tells a story to, to, the, to that generation. And... Uh, they were up and uh, somewhat subliminally intellectual, but yet fun to listen to. And they're classics. Speak. I remember when <coughs> Randall brought me a song after Apple's Peaches had become such a big hit. They brought me a song, and uh, they used to sing for me live uh, when they wrote something. And they brought me Keep the Ball Rolling. Who were they? Windsor and Randall. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. We wrote a lot of great songs and still do. Oh, you know I'm good friends with Barbara Harris of The Toys. Right. Well, they did The Toys, with the Lover's Concerto, and they wrote uh, Good Night, My Love, which I recorded with the Duprees, and they wrote Baby, Make Your Own Sweet Music, which I did with the Techniques, and um, were very consistent in their songwriting. They were. So you had the, man, you, it's, it, you're surrounded by all this uh, talent, and you were able to pool it together. Well, I was able to, and not at the time thinking about it, compete with the, uh, with the uh, English invasion, so to speak, Beatlemania. And, you know, the expression that uh, Kevin Bacon talks about all the time, six... Degrees of separation. Six degrees of separation. <coughs> Everyone, everywhere, some way, somehow is connected. And Beatlemania and I were connected in many, many ways. And I love to speak about it because as I look back on it, it was fun. It was uh, uh, conflicting at times. And, uh, but the, uh, my first association uh, with the Beatles was when their records were being introduced from England 
to the states, and everybody was turning them down. All the record companies turned them down uh, until uh, VJ picked up one or two, and uh, a company, uh, from what I recall, uh, Bernie Lowe at Cameo Parkway was first offered uh, She Loves You, and he turned it down. So his good friends and former producer of American Bandstand, Tony Mamarella, who uh, owned the, the Swan label, they had Freddie Cannon, they decided to pick it up. Well, you know, they released She Loves You three times. But the third time they released it, I had produced a record which I had licensed to them, which Kenny Gamble and I wrote and I produced called Who Do You Love by the Sapphires. And it was breaking real big. It was climbing up the R&B charts. It was already top ten and was starting to cross over. And uh, Swan decided to re-release She Loves You because it was the other Beatles records were breaking off of VJ. So Swan decided to focus their marketing attention off of My Sapphires, which was now top 30, and onto the Beatles. And probably if I had been head of the record company at the time, I may have done the same thing. But they couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. So they'd rather sell a record than develop an artist, which the Sapphires certainly were. So the Beatles, She Loves You, went number one, and I went out the door and took my Sapphires to ABC Paramount, where we recorded Thank You for Loving Me, and Got a Lot of Love, a lot of, a lot of wonderful songs, which uh, Wisner and Renzetti uh, arranged along with me. That was my first counterpunch from the Beatles. And then uh, my good friend from Allentown, one more time, sent me a group that was, they were college students from uh, upstate Pennsylvania. They called themselves the Rondells. Oh, okay. And uh, I really liked their music. They were uh, uh, Beach Boy-like with a surfing sound. And I caught them at a, at a club in Atlantic City, and I really liked them. So I recorded the Rondells. Did some great tracks with them, which are in my Yo Philadelphia CD, by the way. You get a chance to hear them. Um, I enjoyed the group and, and, and believed in them so much. And so, by happen chance, happen sense, did Brian Epstein. He liked the group so much that he took them away from me, had them breach their contract, and told them that he was going to make them stars. And he changed their name to The Circle. I did okay. not know that. Red rubber... <laughs> And uh, the record became a huge hit, and of course they were tied in with the Beatles and toured with them. But we sued them for breaking their contract, because they, uh, we had them for management and for production, and the, the Rondells became the circle. So that was my next encounter with the Beatles. Then came Bobby Hebb and Sonny, went number one in Cashbox, number two in Billboard, number one in Record World, and was nominated in 1966 for a Grammy, as you may or may not recall. I did not know it was nominated for a Grammy. Nominated for a Grammy, Bobby Hebb and myself, uh, but we didn't make the cut. Top five songs, two of which, Can't Take My Eyes Off of You, and The Beatles, Paul McCartney, Yesterday. And yesterday he won the Grammy. That was my third encounter with the Beatles. So Sonny, Can't Take My Eyes Off You, Yesterday, and two other songs were nominated? I don't recall at the time. And the next encounter with the Beatles was when Bobby Ebb, the opening act in 1966 stadium, with the Beatles. And also on that bill were the Red Rubber Ball guys, the circle. So... It, my encounter with Beatlemania went on and on and on, and of course Bobby toured with the, the Beatles for the the rest of that uh, the rest of the tour. But interestingly enough, just recently, it just goes to show you that what goes around does come around. Uh, through <coughs> music connections, uh, as they have uh, over the years, the city of Philadelphia came to me indirectly to ask. Paul McCartney to come to Philadelphia to accept the Marian Anderson Award. Wow. Which he did not acknowledge and he did not accept. Shame on Paul. 
who we're competing with tonight. He has a big uh, webcast of his new album. Did you know that? Yeah, well, I think his new album just came out. He did a number of standards. Yeah, and at 7 p.m. he started launching his webcast. So uh, maybe we competed with that a little. All right, well, I don't believe I've ever been in competition with any one musical genre. Um, doing what I believed in and followed my instincts. <laughs> So if I was lucky enough to, uh, and luck being, of course, preparation, meeting opportunity, um, was able to write and produce music that I had first heard in my head and eventually the world would hear. So putting all of that together, being in the right place at the right time and having the, uh, the opportunity to uh, surround myself with great musicians and arrangers and studios having the freedom of being able to market and call the shots, so to speak, uh, is what makes it all happen. And if you're at the right place at the right time, it can happen. When I was about to start my label, I had uh, a number of uh, successes discovering and working with Bill Deal and the Rondells out of the Virginia area with uh, I've Been Hurt and May I and What Kind of Fool and then we had the Duprees that were breaking with the Good Night, My Love. And uh, I wanted to get European distribution. So my marketing manager, Hal uh, Charm, and myself, and my wife-to-be, April Young, went to uh, England first, and then uh, to uh, Amsterdam, where we were sitting in a, uh, in a diner uh, with all of the brass and mirrors, and a big Wurlitzer jukebox playing. And my attention was keen at the time. I had my antennas up. And I'm listening to this song that just came on the jukebox, and I called the uh, manager over, and I said, what is that? That's terrific. He said, oh, that's a group from Amsterdam. So I flew to Amsterdam, and I signed The Shocking Blue. One of my favorite records of all time. An intro to Venus just turned my head, and the rest was history. The very next day, being in the right place at the right time, same Hollywood situation, sitting in a diner, well, it's your jukebox playing, and I'm listening to Ma Bella Me. I called the manager over, and I said, that's terrific, I really like that song. Where are they from, and who are they? He said, well, they're just a local group, but they're from Amsterdam. I flew back to Amsterdam, because I was in Hamburg at the time, signed the tea set, and released the Shocking Blue on my new Colossus label. The rest was history. The record went to number one. My Bel Ami went to number three. And then I started to get bombarded from all over the world, because people <laughs> said, the fans, the music fans out there said, hey, I, I think you started the Dutch Invasion. The Dutch Invasion. The songs that I heard um, was by the George Baker selection called Little Green Bag, which I then released on my label and has become a classic. So being in the right place at the right time, having your antennas up, um, and the collaboration is what, ra what, what really makes things happen. Who distributed uh, Colossus Records? I applied all of that to the journey of my goals, the fundamentals, the guidelines that I try to stick with. And if you don't know what they are, you don't know what those guidelines are, then you haven't made any preparation to be ready for the opportunities that might be ahead of you. So, like the expression goes, Joe, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. And you gotta have, uh, got to have humility, got to have some got to have self-confidence, got to follow your instincts. And uh, by the way, did I mention talent? And like Mr. Shakespeare said, talent will out. So all of the work ethics, the networking, the collaboration, enjoy the journey, and the greatest risk is not taking one. Interesting. So from time to time, I love to philosophize because the meaning if you can take it seriously, and I do, can get you where you want to go. 
So how did you... Um, Touchy subject, philosophy, right? It, it certainly is.